Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining Cybersecurity Career Talks. I am your coach, your host, your teacher on this journey with you as we explore different cybersecurity roles until you find your dream job. I have with me three hackers. Um, the first one is Adriel Desotels, and he is the CEO and founder of uh, Netrograd, which uses uh, realistic threat penetration testing, which is uh, red teaming, as it is called now. He started his company in 2006, and he has over 20 years experience in information, information security. Um, the next, next person I'm going to introduce is uh, Jason E. Street. Uh, Jason, say hi. Hi. So, um, and uh, Jason is the VP of uh, InfoSec, InfoSec Spear NY. And uh, he, is, he is the author of the, um, of the uh, series uh, Hack. Dissecting the Hacks. Dissecting uh, it's a trilogy. The hacks. Yes. Dissecting yeah. the Hacks. Uh, <clears throat> and he uh, is a speaker at probably most of the cons that I have been to. He was a uh, uh, speaker at uh, SECON New Jersey. That's how I met him. And uh, thank you so much, Jason. Uh, mm -hmm. Felipe Catrugelli is uh, our third, uh, third uh, guest. And uh, Felipe has got a great career. He has worked in different continents of the world. He started off um, as a info, InfoSec manager in a big uh, pharma company in London. Then he transitioned over as a senior manager in Deloitte in Luxembourg. And now he is the partner and chief hacking officer at Netrograd. Hello. Um, hi. Before we, before we start, I will just uh, read a brief disclaimer. So the views expressed in this presentation and during the session are the personal opinions of the participants and do not reflect the official policy or position of their respective employers. This discussion is a volunteer led effort to contribute to the profession and pay forward the many kindnesses and instances of support and guidance that the participants have received in the course of their career. My boss appreciates that. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and uh, I'm sure my boss will appreciate it as well. <laughs> so as we, like, um, first thing I want to ask you, and uh, maybe Jason, um, what is, like, when we talk about hackers, right? Uh, right. We, we say, oh, black hat, white hat, and, you know, different shades, right? We do right. not talk about that the same way about doctors. We do not talk about it like auditors or any other professionals. If you talk about, we never say, oh, this is like a black head doctor or a white head doctor. So what's going on? So how do you describe who is a hacker? And can you tell us a little bit about? Yeah. Uh, to, to talk about hackers, it's like you have to understand how the word has evolved. It's like words have power and words change meaning. It's like what a word means in one country is different than what it means in another. It's like it's all about how it's interpreted. Uh, and so um, when you talk about hackers, it's like it's not computers. It's like people automatically assume and tie hacker means that they have to work with a computer. And that's not true. Leonardo da Vinci never worked with a computer, but he's a hacker. It's like Nikolai Tesla was a hacker. Uh, Alan Turing was a hacker. Albert Einstein was a hacker. It's like, forget about Edison. It's like all these people were hackers. They were inventors. Bill Gates, uh, Wozniak, it's like, they're all hackers. It's like, so it's about looking at something and finding a different solution that everybody tells you what it is. Trying to make things different, trying to think outside the box or recognize there is no box. It's like, that's what being a hacker is. It's like, it's just finding different solutions that are not readily present. Uh, and so as the time goes on, it's like, and as, as the word has evolved, it's like, it's like, because before 
in the 60s, there was no word for a hack. There was no, it was no designation. It's like it was created by MIT. It's like in railroad trains, I believe. It's like where it started. So it's like that became the word hacker. And then it started becoming synonymous with um, computer technology. It's like circumventing the rules on the computer, making the program do something it didn't wasn't originally programmed to do. It's like no hacker in history has ever created a vulnerability. It's like they discovered the vulnerabilities that were already there. That's the key point. It's like, so uh, that's what being a hacker is. It's like, and so now it's like, and we'll go and talk about, um, but this modern day age, it's like, we now make it synonymous with criminal. Well, you know what? It's like, I've been held at gunpoint. I've been mugged at gunpoint. I never assumed that the guy with the gun was an NRA member. I never assumed that he was a second rights amendments activist. I didn't assume that he was a gunsmith and he created that gun and that's what he's robbing me with. No, it's like, that's not what, that's not factual and that's ridiculous. Then why do we give criminals who use computers to commit crime or use um, tools that legitimate hackers have created to commit crime? Why do we give them the same recognition and the same designation as hacker they're not they're criminals they don't deserve that title it's like they download the tools they watch a youtube video they pay a service and then they try to get paid it's like it's just another tool for a criminal to commit crime with it's like and i have never met a black hat banker but their prisons are pretty full with a lot of uh, bankers that have been arrested and prosecuted for embezzlement and money laundering but they're not black hat bankers. I don't go to my white hat banker. It's like to, to get my withdrawals. It's like, I've there's a lot of doctors that I've seen been arrested for malpractice. It's like who have done negligence and it's like, and, and, and have suffered from that. But I don't go to a white hat doctor. It's like, because I don't want to go to a black hat doctor and get my kidney sold. It's like, I mean, well, not with I wouldn't be able to get good money with my kidneys. So it's like, uh, they'd probably go after my liver, but still it's like, I don't, I don't have to worry about going to a black hat doctor and do it because that's ridiculous. Cause it's like, they're criminals. If you're a hacker, if you're a truly a hacker and you commit a crime, then you're a criminal. You're a criminal. Who's also a hacker, but every hacker isn't a criminal. That's the difference that we need to get the media to understand and, and we get, need to get people to understand. It's like, so it's like, there's no negative connotation. I always, from my Uber driver to people at conference, whoever asked me, it's like, I make sure they understand. It's like, what do you do for that? I'm a hacker. I say it with pride because there's nothing wrong with that. It's like, we need to take that word back. And it's like, and that's a hill I'm going to die on. It's like, it's just one of those things. But we just have to understand. It's like, it's not just based on computers. It's based on creativity. It's based on passion. It's based on learning. It's like, that's what it means to be a hacker. You were born a hacker. Every single person on this planet was born a hacker. It's like, um, remember when you were three or four your, or five, the imagination, the, the creativity, the, you know, using little sticks for guns. It's like, you know, it's like making mud pies. It's like, you know, doing all these different things because you had that creativity and that imagination. It's like, unfortunately, pe some people have lost it. But hackers have not lost that imagination. They have not lost that creativity. They've kept it up. That's why we're big kids. It's like, I mean, I'm still in my pajamas. It's like, I mean, it's just, it's how we roll. So, uh, Jason, uh, why don't you call yourself a security researcher? Uh, be uh, because are, they, that's, are they the same or like, is there a difference? No, that's my job. That's my job. It's like my job is a security, uh, 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 information security. My job is uh, social engineering. My, my job is uh, all these other titles you can put on me. It's like, but that doesn't make, that's not what I am. It's like, that's what I do to get paid. It's like, so uh, being a hacker is less about a profession and it's more of a pursuit. It's like, so if I'm an artist, it's like, and I create canvases and paintings, it's like at home. But then I go into an office in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue and I create marketing and I create commercials and I create uh, logos. It's like, I'm not, I'm still an artist, but I'm also marketing. 
I'm also a marketing person. It's like, you don't, when I don't, when I'm left the job, you don't still call me up. I'm, I'm not going to identify as a marketer. I'm not going to identify as a logo creator. It's like, I'm going to be an artist. It's like, but then I get paid for those certain skills. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for making that differentiation. Um, and uh, Phil, uh, so, so when did you stop being like a, a corporate senior manager and uh, transition to a hacker? Or would you say that you've always been a hacker and these are the different roles that you've worked with? Uh, yeah, I've always been an hacker. So being like uh, working in the corporate world was just a job, like uh, uh, Jason said. Um, um, at the time, I didn't know that I could make money what I was like to do, <laughs> which is like uh, uh, the vulnerability research and, and, and trying to uh, uh, break into a uh, customer's network. Um, so I did other jobs that was related to, to IT security um, until I found the thing that I really, really liked. But uh, even before that, it started when I was a, a, a kid, the first computer that I had, tried to understand how it worked. Um, I was like in the mid 90s, so it was pretty uh, expensive just to get to the internet because you had to do long distance call. Um, so I figured instead of uh, uh, calling out and spending money, why don't I run a server on my house and get people to connect to me? So I created this old BBS uh, uh, thing at home. Um, so yeah, even as a kid, I was always been a hacker uh, until I, and then I got different corporate job until I found the one that I really like. It doesn't feel like a job now. It's just like doing what I love. So Adriel, when did you discover that you are a hacker? Um, boy, I think that uh, I discovered that from day one. <laughs> I, I have always been uh, kind of tinkering with things, tearing things apart. And I always had this innate curiosity to understand how everything worked from the inside. Uh, when I was about six or seven, my dad got uh, his first PC, um, told me I couldn't touch it. And of course, because he said I couldn't touch it, I was motivated to play with it. Uh, and from there, uh, I just kind of grew. Um, I expanded out, uh, got a modem, learned we could get in other people's computers, do all kinds of interesting things with those, uh, and just just kind of grew. Um, and since then, you know, I think I think that when you do what we do in the security industry, there are all kinds of jobs within this industry that are all very different, right? And they all require a different set of skills in terms of programming languages and uh, you know, operating systems and things like that, but they require the mindset also, which is the thing that you're born with. I found that uh, what I really enjoyed doing uh, was zero day exploitation uh, and reaching networks in a covert manner. And I also really got a thrill from uh, figuring out how to exfiltrate data uh, in a covert way. Um, and then since then, I've kind of grown into the more uh, corporate side of security with running NetroGuard. And so I I miss a lot of the stuff that I used to do, but I live vicariously through Phil for a lot of that now, which is really good. Thanks. Um, Jason, can you describe your journey and how did you start off? Did you go to college for this becoming a hacker? Can you, can you tell us what your journey is? Uh, I'm a high school dropout uh, who used to live behind a dumpster. So uh, mine's probably not the same typical uh, route that most people will take uh, on their journey into computer security. Uh, but it's, um, like I said, it's still following passion. It's like, I was actually um, in high school on the debate team. It's like, I was destined to be a lawyer. It's like, you know, it's like, I mean, that's what I was going to do. Thank goodness it wouldn't have paid well. Cause I would have been one of those weird pro bono guys who, who went after corporations and stuff. But, uh, but yeah, so it's like, that was where my path was. It's like, and then, uh, some, uh, some health problems happened with my family and it's like, and I had to, uh, quit school to support the family. But, um, it's like one of the key things though is, it's about learning. It's like, it's always about learning. I never stopped trying to learn. I never stopped trying to be inquisitive. It's like, I actually uh, got into physical security uh, and law enforcement working on, on that side. It's like, it's like, you know, that you hear about the hackers all the story for some reason, the hackers are always, uh, you know, they, oh, they learned by breaking into systems and they learned like robbing places and going, and then they became good. And I'm like, mother, 
I, I didn't break into a system until I got, until I had permission. My first system, it was like mine. It's like, I didn't do it from that way. I, I'm one of those white bread, boring kind of guys when it comes about my origin story. It's like, I don't got any cool stories about like, you know, I mean, there's places where I've broken into before, but it's like nothing like where it's like, you know, it's like computer systems. So uh, I started off on uh, physical security. And whenever I did physical security, especially when I was doing the guard duties and stuff, I would always look at the building like, if I robbed them, how would I do it? Where would I go? And then I would look and be like, well, there should be a camera right there because I could sneak in that way. Or why isn't there a guard patrolling over on this side? It's like, I would always look at the place like an attacker, like I'm going to rob it. And that showed gaps in their security. And so I would go and report that and they would hate me for it because like, well, that costs more money or it's like, that's not your job, Jason. Just sit on the, I'm one of those annoying guards, the ones that you hate the most because I don't sleep on the job and I'm always making sure you have the badge. And it's like, and I would like write up people. I had people like get mad at me because it's like, if they parked in the no parking zone, it's like in front of the Kroger's, it's like, I'd be like calling their butts out. Like, no, you got to move it. That's the rules. So yeah, I was one of those guys. And then in 2000, I found out it's like, a, well, 95, I got tired of getting shot at and I went to help desk and desktop support. That's when I first started learning the computer stuff because I taught myself how to use the computer. I taught myself how to work it with 311. It's like, and then I upgraded, uh, that's how old I am. It's like, I remember 311. I remember upgrading to 95 with those freaking 20 something floppy disk and number 18 being corrupted going like, what the, f it's like, I right in the middle of the install. So it's like, so that's what I remember. And then I got into desktop support. And then, in, and then in 2000, I was introduced to computer security. And I was like, what? I can do computers and security and help people and I don't get shot at? Because I've been shot at before. So it's like, I'm like, this is awesome. I want this. And now I'm back to the position now, especially due to NetraGuard and, and Adriel, back to going to places where I might get shot at. But, you know, it's a vicious circle. It's like uh, how that comes back around. But uh, but I'm still in information security, which I love. So so we will talk about the time when you and Phil uh, robbed a bank in Beirut. But <laughs> it was only one... Everybody mentions the wrong <laughs> bank that I robbed. No one mentions about all the banks that I did rob that I was supposed to. Okay. It's like I robbed so many that I was supposed to. I only robbed one wrong one. Okay. All right. So, uh, Phil, can you talk about your journey from like um, transitioning from um, London, Luxembourg to US and how, how did you like transition? What did you do? What did you learn from it? Uh, and can you share it with our viewers today so that uh, they can use uh, points from there and, and uh, learn from there? Suppose they are try trying to transition uh, to the US. Yeah, uh, well, uh, honestly, yeah, the first time I, I came to the US on a, um, for a security conference for DEF CON uh, conference, that's when I met Jason in DEF CON 12, I think. I was like mind blown, like how many people are doing the same thing as I do. Uh, um, because doing it uh, uh, outside of the US, uh, there's the language barrier uh, between the different countries. So you're like limited to uh, people doing the same thing in, in, in your country with your own language. Uh, so I would say one of the most important things to, to, to do is really learn English and, and do all your, your uh, uh, work in English, unfortunately, because that's the way uh, um, all the, the people in the security community uh, uh, communicate. So if you want to broaden your, your of you and your, your uh, network, uh, you'll have to, to um, learn English and communicate in, in English. Um, so yeah, that was the, the biggest uh, difference. There's a lot of good hackers in, in every country that I've been to. Um, the only difference is in the US, the country is much bigger and everybody speaks the same language. So there's not like this uh, uh, um, separation between uh, uh, the different countries. So the groups is much bigger. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, Phil, um, what? How did? What? what how did you? Uh, did you go to college? What did you learn? And uh, how did you learn of these like security techniques? And then, when did you say that? Okay, now I'm done with these tools that other people have written. I'm going to now create something. I'm going to maybe write. Do you? Do you learn like software languages? What? What exactly? 
uh, were things that you learned that make you successful today? Yeah. So I actually, yeah, I went to to school. I went. To, I did an engineering school in in computer science. Uh, I learned telecommunication and networks. Um, so it's good, but um, most of the thing that I, I use or I feel like I learn more more on the job every day than what I learn at school. Um, uh, I have an example. Like a few years ago, I was uh, uh, testing uh, an application for a customer in in uh, 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 PHP. And in like a few weeks of doing the test, I learned more about uh, uh, object programming than in two years at school. Because um, it's just like, you have a meaning of uh, uh, doing your, your research and your test rather than just uh, learning out of the book. Um, so yeah, I did. Um, I went to an IT school, but I learned more on the, on the, on the job or by myself uh, uh, every day. For somebody who is, uh, who wants to like uh, start a career, uh, what what advice would you give them? Well, uh, you have to find something that you that you like. Um, so, and if you like it, then there's now, uh, uh, fortunately, there's a lot of, of resources on the internet, uh, and it's just try and, and fail, and that's how you learn uh, uh, more than just waiting for somebody to tell you this is the way to to do it. I remember like the example that I gave at school. I mean. I could sit for hours uh, listening to the teacher telling me how oh, uh, uh, object programming and C++ is working until I actually had a, an application in front of me and trying to break into the application and try to understand how the developer actually uh, 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 create the application. And that's where you, you learn the most, I think. Sure, thanks. Adriel, what made you start Netragrad in 2006 and say, okay, I'm done with working? And, and uh, what was behind that decision and how did your uh, journey transition from uh, like working as an information security manager and uh, come into uh, CEO and founder? Yeah, so I started off um, actually working uh, in the industry fresh out of high school. And uh, at the same time, I was going to college. And what I learned really early on, pretty much in line with what Phil said, was what I was learning in, in college uh, was useless in comparison to what I was learning in the field. Um, the, the programming languages and techniques that we were using were antiquated in comparison to what I was doing, you know, live in the world. Um, and uh, it just, it just, it didn't seem like I was paying for something of much value. I felt like what I was really doing was I was reading books and then I was regurgitating the content without really using the content to pass some kind of a, a, a test. So somebody else could tell me I was good at what I did. Um, and so for that reason and a few other reasons, I decided that I was going to drop out of school uh, and just, uh, you know, work for myself. So what I ended up doing was <clears throat> um, I dropped out. Uh, I used uh, some of the money that I'd made um, in the stock market for one of the companies I was working with to uh, start my first company, which was Snowsoft or Secure Network Operations. Um, we gained a lot of notoriety uh, by that company for going after HP is true 64. Um, and you can Google that. There's all kinds of really interesting history of the internet <laughs> uh, with relation to that. Um, uh, shortly after uh, that company was completed and certain aspects of it were acquired by a third party, um, I decided that I wanted to, uh, you know, kind of take a break. And somebody approached us or approached me uh, and said, hey, we're looking for a company that can deliver real, you know, high threat penetration testing services. And I said, well, we don't really you know, we were being mostly researched and other things prior. Um, and I said, all right, well, we'll try to find somebody that can do this. And in all the searching that we did, the only thing we could find was pen testing companies that did vulnerability scanning and, and you know, services that were highly automated and they were not operating a level of threat that was at all close to what the bad guys were doing. And so to kind of shorten the story, <clears throat> we said, all right, uh, why don't we take a stab at this? And so uh, Kevin and a few other guys um, that I was I was working with way back then also, uh, we all got together and we used our research methodology and kind of augmented it. And we tested, uh, you know, we tested the bank um, and we breached, we took the domain uh, and it was all a very short time. And so they started talking about us and people started coming to us and we said, all right, well, we should form another company. <laughs> uh, and so I, I ended up forming uh, this with another guy called, our name David Morris. Um, and he eventually transitioned out and 
uh, things progressed, NetroGuard grew, and that was back in 2006, and here we are today. Uh, the only only gripe that I have is, while I love running a company, um, one of my mentors actually said a long time ago, you're going to have to decide between being somebody who runs a business, an executive, or somebody who actually gets their hands dirty and technical. And I said to him, I said, no, there's no way I'm going to have to do that. Well, <laughs> you know, I have to think about a lot of other stuff other than just the technical aspect. And it, it's a hard thing to do, but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> sure. Um, coming back to uh, people are asking on the live stream, uh, do hackers need to have certificates, like certifications? No, 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 no. wait, wait, wait. Because you, all of us on this, <clears throat> on this uh, live stream have CISSPs. So <laughs> I, I say, let me, let's be real with that. When it comes down, it's paper. It's like, and paper is good for one important factor. It gets you in the door. A college degree certificate, they're both papers. I'm not going to go and say you have to have a college degree. I'm saying that it, it works. I think sometimes a college degree helps if you learn from that college degree and you're actually learning the skills because it helps teach you things that I, I had to learn a lot of things. I learned everything the hard way. It's like, I did not have someone tell me, Oh, this is the way that you had, you, you were supposed to get something done. So I would have to try to find all these other ways that failed before I can get the one that worked. Some of them were really creative. It's like, I once created 13 different phantom com ports to get a modem working on a machine. That's like, it should technically not have worked, but it did. So it's like, so it's like, so, I mean, you, you learn those things by that. So the college helps show you how it's supposed to be done, uh, which is great. But the other thing is that you look at is that the certificate also shows, Hey, this certificate, it's like, uh, they completed this course. They did this learning. They know this, this minimum level. It doesn't matter. The paper may get you in the door. The paper is good for getting the, uh, recruiter to get the HR person happy, to fill the requirements that are necessary, that they must have this or they must have X. Once you're in that door, it's your knowledge, it's your passion, it's your personality, it's your ability to adapt and your ability to learn that keeps you that job. Don't think that that's your golden ticket into any place. It's like a CISSP, uh, a Security Plus, it's like a SAM cert, those are great because they help give you the they pinpoint. They tell you in things that you may not have realized. You may not have realized that bollards are part of security. Thank you, CISSP. It's like, you, you know, you may not have learned and stuff, you know, that TCP dump has these different five functions. Thank you, SANS. It's like, you may not have known. It's like, you know, it's like the, the flags for NMAP. Thank you, uh, you know, SEC+. Plus. It's like, so it, it may help you with these functions. It may help you with that information. But if you don't go with it, if you don't go past that, then they're worthless to you in the long run. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I literally, I can show you a picture. I literally in my bathroom, in my lab is like, there are all my certificates. I hung them all up in my bathroom. It's like all my certifications, all like, I've got like 20 or 30. It's like right up there. And the highest one is my GED. It's like, you know, it's like, that's the one that's like, and they're all framed because I want to be fancy, except for a couple of them because I didn't like them that much. It's like, uh, but yeah, it's like all those, because once you've got them, great. But if you're only getting them just to get in the door, then you better have something to back it up. <clears throat> It's not a golden ticket. It is a way to get into the door. You have to then prove that you're supposed to be there. You have to then prove that you belong there. So it's like, so this whole fight and the, all the little Twitter drama that you get about CISSP versus, uh, sorry, I got a CISSP back in 2001, March 17th. It's like, and I'm like, I'm telling you right now, it's like, there was no boot camp. There were no books. It was cccure.org, uh, and it was uh, two different books, and that was it. I had to go to New Orleans because there were no testing sites. You went to the one place. There were two guys from Brazil and one from France that shown up because they only did them in certain locations at certain times. And, and one guy didn't ha had an English, had definitions in his translation book, and so they had to remove it. It's like, I mean, it was difficult. It's like to get that freaking test. It's like, but 
so what? It's like the paper got me in the door. It's like it helped me with places. But if I would have just left it there and just rested on my laurels of like, I'm a CISSP, then I would not be where I'm at right now. It's like, yeah. and I mean, so it's like, so um, CISSPs are good when you're starting out. It's like certifications are good when you're starting out. College is good when you're starting out. But if you don't progress beyond that, then I, I don't see where you're going. It's like, it's like you have to go past that. You can't just rest on that. Yeah, I would, I would say that, um, say that what Jason said is exactly right. A, a degree, a certificate, um, any of the pieces of paper, it's a representation of what you've experienced. Um, the, the inverse is, and, and, and the path that I followed uh, was I, I demonstrated my experience publicly by publishing research and by doing things that got a lot of press and media attention and wowed people. And so I was able to use that demonstrated experience in the same way that somebody would use a degree um, or a certificate uh, to advance themselves in the industry without having earned that degree. Mm. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, in many respects, you know, both require studying, they just require different kinds of studying. Uh, when I was going through school, I really didn't feel like they were teaching me what I needed to know to do what I wanted to do. There was nothing about exploitation. There were no classes that taught about security and vulnerability in any of the schools that I was looking for. And that was the stuff that I was interested in. Today is different. I mean, today you can actually go to school and you can take courses, um, you know, on, on all types of different security things. Um, so I, I think, I think there are parallels, but in the end, the paper represents experience and you have to be able to demonstrate experience to get anywhere. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering, I'm wondering how many banks I have to rob before I can get an honorary degree at a college somewhere, you know, it's like, I'm still, I, I'm, I'm only going to, the only way I'm going to get a college degree if it's an honorary one. So it's like, how many places do I have to rob to get one? You know, it's like, that's, that's what I'm looking for. So Phil, what is your experience? Uh, well, I both have degrees and certifications, so I'm not going to say that uh, mm -hmm. uh, they are useless because they help me get where I am today. Uh, so it's definitely useful. Uh, but I would say that I'm not where I am today just because of the certification. As Jason said, it just opened the door. Uh, it helps validating your, your, your knowledge uh, when you're doing the, your, your interviews. You don't necessarily have like three hours to, ex to uh, uh, explain or, or prove that you know this topic, but having the certification just opens the door because it shows that you uh, sat for four or six hours uh, uh, to an exam uh, and learn all this. Um, so it's definitely uh, uh, helpful, uh, but it's not because you have the certification that you definitely get the job uh, uh, that you dream of. Sure, thanks. So like Jason, I also took my CSSP in 2001. That was the first time it was offered in India. Mm -hmm. And before that you had to go to Singapore and. Um, nobody would uh, you know uh, pay for my going anywhere so uh, but but, but uh, what i feel is that having a certification now today if jason like people go to jason and um, come to adriel and um, natrograd uh, they don't ask like okay can you show me what your certifications are or something but when they when maybe adriel is putting in that um, um, a, a request for a request for proposal, etc. He'll say, "Oh, we have so many CISSPs on our thing." So it's become like a more marketing stuff. Yeah. But to, once you have pro proven yourself, I don't think like today. I mean, does anybody even know that you have a CISSP? I, I have to be honest. I have to confess. It's like just if for full disclosure. It's like my CISSP lapsed. It's like. And I just got so tired of not seeing a return value with some of the drama that was going on, especially on Twitter with the CISSP and the people that were trying to be on the board and the popularity contest involved in it. I was like, I'm out. It's like, I mean, my company would pay for my dues. It wasn't a thing about money. It was just like, I don't need this anymore. It's like, I'm good. It's like, so, but I'm a a one-off but once again that's because like i said i've robbed a quite a few places people i'm established in my field i'm known for what i can do i don't need the paper anymore it's an important piece of paper when you're first getting started i would not be where i'm at without a cissp i acknowledge that 
I would not be where I'm at without the sand cert. It's like my GSEC, GCFI, uh, uh, GCIH. It's like, it's like I, those helped me in my career, but you, but if you just keep, it, it's one of the, this is what it's like. Keeping your CISSP and keep falling back on it and, and proudly wearing it and going like, I've got, it's like a guy in his 40s wearing his lettersman jacket from football from when he was in high school and he was the quarterback of the team. That's like, good job. It's like, you know, you're, 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 you're 50 pounds overweight and it's like you barely fit in the jacket. But yeah, you're, you're, you were the high school football captain. Great for you. What have you done lately? It's like, when's that last touchdown come through, you know? So it's like, you can't just say resting on that CISSP going, well, I've got a CISSP and I'm like, here's your cookie. You know, it's like, what is that doing for me? It's like, show me what you know. Okay. Not what paper you have. Sure. Thank you so much. And uh, now coming back to, um, suppose somebody because there are a bunch of people in in the live chat and they are asking so how do i get started so what is your advice and can you show them like what, what, what how do they yeah. get started do they start with some kind of hackers academy or some pen testers school or something online or how how do they go about it and can you tell people like set expectations because sometimes like you know all these academies everywhere they feel that oh it today, if you're driving a bicycle, you go do this three months and now you'll get a BMW. This is going to happen and that is yeah. going and can I, you- I think one of the key things I get asked more than anything else in my DMs, it's like, and people ask me, it's like, uh, Jason, how do I become a hacker? How do I become a hacker? How do I get involved? I literally created a website uh, about hacking, about what really a hacker is. It's IR0NIN.com ironin.com and there's a page on that site the getting started page which is literally a nothing but a page full of resources and videos and links on how to get started in information security how to get started in hacking it's like uh and i'm sure uh i mean uh adriel and philippe they also have uh, uh ways to get involved and everything but it's like i just i get that so much i literally just created a web uh, a page on the website for it it's like because it's like because it, it's a valid question because people are curious and and it's something that's going to be it's one of those things that are interesting. It's like there's never been a time where it's like I thought like wow hacking is so boring, you know. It's like it, it's always exciting. There's always something to do with it. So everybody wants to see that. It's like they don't see the boringness that actually exists from information security which is valid. It's like, you know, looking at, at IDS logs all day, not as exciting as you would see in the movies, you know? It's like, you don't see in the Matrix, it's like, you know, Trinity uh, scanning through that in-map log, right? It's like, no, it's like, it's like it, that, that can be boring. It's like, but it's necessary. So it's like, so you have to look at from both sides of it. So you have to, uh, when I tell people, it's like when you're looking to get started, you don't get started in information security by saying, this is a good career choice, which field will make me the most money? Because congratulations, you'll get that first thing for like three years, maybe five years, and then you're gonna burn out and you wanna go you know, go to a goat farm. It's like, congratulations. It's like, that's how's that gonna work out for you? It's like, you wanna find something that you're interested in. The first question that you ask yourself before you get a job in information security is what do I like learning about? What do I like doing? Do I like looking for bugs and vulnerabilities and applications? Do I like web security? Do I like the TCP logs? Do I like doing uh, DFIR? Do I like uh, doing incident response? Do I like going through and do I like numbers and do I like math, uh, mathematics and doing cryptography? It's like, what do you like to learn about? What do you like to do? And then you follow that. And then you find someone to pay you for it. And then congratulations, you get to stop working. All three of us, we stopped working a long time ago. It's like now we get a, we do what we love 
and people pay us for it. Don't ask me why, and I'm not going to question it too much because I really like getting paid for stuff that, that I love. But it's like, so I, I don't want to like, I don't want to jinx it. It's like, so it's like straight. I mean, but that's what it's about. It's like, it's like if you you do that, and it's like, and that's like, it sounds like one of those self help folks or motivation things, but it's truth. It's like, it's like I don't burn out because I love what I'm doing. I am helping people be more secure. I'm helping people learn to protect themselves. That's something I did over 30 years ago when I started doing physical security. I like helping to protect people. And that's one of the key things too. It's like, when we talk about that, it's like, it's like, it's about helping people. Uh, all of us are red teamers, you know, it's like sort of like what we call red teamers, like what we're doing. And that's the offensive side of security. It's like red team is now just a blanket. It's like the hacker. It's like, it's the word has evolved. It's like to, to encompass all this stuff. It's like, so basically, we're just, it's like we're the offensive hackers that go in and attack companies. But people lose sight of why. We don't go in there to break stuff. We're there to help the blue team. Our job is to make the blue team better. If we leave a company and they're not more secure after we've left, then we failed. It's like our job is not just to go and say, ha ha, we got domain admin. Because trust me, with Teton on the job, it's like with Sleep on the job, <laughs> we're getting domain admin. Okay. It's like, but that's not the goal. The goal is to show them those vulnerabilities, to show them where they're vulnerable so the criminals can't get in. So the bad guys, so when they, when we leave, they know they're more secure. That's the job of offensive security. It's like you can break stuff all day, but if you don't know how to show them how to fix it, if you don't know how to educate them on the dangers of it, which is one of the things that Adriel does so well, it's like, it's like, because you can't go in there and just say, ha ha, honed you. You have to show them metrics. You have to show them and talk to the executives and you have to talk to the executives like the executives know how to want to be talked to. It's like, it's like, and that's where Andrew comes in and he goes and he explains the, the risk. He shows the metrics. He shows the, the risk mitigation that needs to be done. The risk acceptance that has to be done if they don't want to uh, take the offset of the risk uh, with, with certain things. So it's like, he does all that. So that's what the whole thing is about. It's not just about breaking stuff. It's about learning how to protect others with it. Uh, thanks. And Adriel, there are questions from people. They say that, okay, I'm starting off. Uh, I'm like uh, trying to find a career in um, finding uh, threats, vulnerability, risks, et cetera. And uh, is, is joining a bug bounty program a great thing? <laughs> so my, my philosophy on bug bounty programs um, actually stems from doing a whole bunch of research uh, in them. Uh, I would say that for your own edification, uh, you could use a bug bounty program um, to learn how to legitimately attack and exploit vulnerabilities. But if you're looking at bug bounty programs um, to make money, um, I would say that that's probably not the right way to go. Uh, bug bounty programs, because of the way they're structured today, uh, really promote a high volume of low quality findings. And the, the reason being is if you spend 40 hours working on a vulnerability, right? Whatever your hourly rate might be, you spend 40 hours working on a vulnerability, you find and, and, and you demonstrate this vulnerability to be real and you go and report it to hacker one or bug crowd or whatever it might be. It might be that somebody else already found that vulnerability and you've just burnt 40 hours. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, and you also don't know what the acceptable bounty for that might be. It might be 500 bucks for 40 hours worth of work too. Um, the inverse option is that you look for really basic vulnerabilities um, and you report those basic vulnerabilities in really high volume. Uh, the chances of you finding a basic vulnerability, the chances of you finding a basic vulnerability um, are, are really high. Uh, or, or a horde of them anyways. And the chances of you getting paid um, you know, for any one of those is also substantial. Um, so uh, from a learning perspective, yes. From a money perspective, no. Now there's, 
there's also risk that comes with bug bounties um, that you'll face as a researcher. So if you read the fine print, uh, or just not even fine print, the really big bold print on their website that's a license agreement, <laughs> uh, they pass all liability onto you as the researcher. So uh, if anything happens, uh, or if you knock a system down, or you do something, you know, to warrant uh, some kind of legal action, the bounty program, the company that runs it, isn't going to step in and protect you. It's going to be you against this bounty program. So there's also very little protection. Um, and then finally, uh, you also um, you also have to consider uh, uh, you know things like potentially accessing PII or sensitive data that might be out of the scope of what the bounty is structured to do. Um, except you might inadvertently uh, find a way into accessing that. Uh, and that's a good place where risk can come in uh, with things like GDPR and other types of things. Um, so I would suggest that uh, bug bounties are, are an interesting way to learn. Um, uh, I don't think that they're a great way to make money unless you wanna go high volume, low quality, um, and you have to be willing to accept the risks that are associated. Yeah. I, I look at it this way. It's like it's it's true. It reminds me a lot about like professional basketball players or cricket players or footballers or it's like yeah, or rugby players. It's like it reminds me of it's like, yeah, there's some that like make LeBron James, Michael Jordan, they make bank, right? It's like Pele, Pele makes bank. It's like lots of money. It's like, but what about all the hundreds of thousands of other people? that are never going to make that level, but they keep putting all that time in and stuff, but they're never making it into the, like the big leagues. It's like, so it's the same thing with bug bounty. There's, you know, not everybody's the grok with the, you know, a big pile of a suitcase full of money and stuff, you know, uh, in wall street journal. It's like, not everybody's like naffy. It's like there there's uh or, or whitey cracker. There's like, no, no, not everybody's like all these, like, Oh, I've got all this bounty. Right. It's like uh, for every one of those, who are who've made major bank on it there's all the ones that are getting five dollar bounties or you know they're getting like a ten dollar bounty it's like uh katie mo has a whole thing on 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 what the pros and cons are on uh the bug bounty programs so uh do it with eyes open and it's like and and i mean and and like i said adriel does it but it's like you, you got to understand it's like he's one of the success stories and for every one of those there are hundreds and thousands of ones that aren't and so you just you're just playing the odds it's like so i totally agree with adriel it's like you use it for learning and use it for an excuse but do it carefully sure thanks and um, so so we talked about bug bounty but now i want to point out what adriel had started the zero day exploit market and uh, i think he it, there was a documentary on Weisland about it and adriel <laughs> if you can talk a little bit about that yeah, so um, back in uh, 1998, um, we were doing uh, some work with an organization and uh, we developed an iTunes zero day exploit or something like that. No, it wasn't iTunes, it was another MP3 player, but <laughs> because iTunes wasn't around, um, something like that. And uh, when we developed uh, the exploit, we had a buyer um, that was interested in spending something like $16,000 on this, if memory serves correctly. And we thought, well, you know, $16,000 for an exploit in a media player, we couldn't really understand the justification for that immediately, but we took the money. And then uh, as, we, as we progressed, uh, we began to get more and more uh, targeted research requests for things like operating systems, some unusual software packages. And we noticed that the, uh, the money with the zero day exploit stuff was really growing and it was beneficial. It's actually helping to fund and drive the first company. Um, as we progressed into uh, about 2003 or so, I think it was, uh, that program uh, really, really took off. There was a lot more interest and I'm assuming it's because there was a lot more value in the functions that were provided by these tools. Um, the market itself, I, when I got into it, uh, I actually created it with a guy named Bob. I won't give his last name, but created it with a guy named Bob, uh, who was one of our buyers on either side. Um, it was something that I started doing uh, really almost as a patriotic move forward because um, I knew that these tools 
could be used for really good purposes. And I knew that they could be used um, you know, to help sort of counter the threat. What I also knew though, <clears throat> was that uh, foreign governments and foreign you know, uh, actors were other enemies of the state, right? I uh, were, were doing the same kind of research and they were uh, building up their own set of tools. And if we didn't, as a country, have this capability, um, then they would. Um, and as it turned out, you know, I wasn't the only person doing this. There are a few other people that started the market, but it was a really small market. Um, as, uh, as the market uh, grew, uh, when we uh, sold off Snowsoft and started NetRegard, we kept on uh, you know, selling this through NetRegard. In fact, that's how I funded the onset of NetRegard other than the projects um, was with the zero day work that we were doing. Um, as the market grew, more and more players came into the market um, and it began to get shady. So historically it was, you know, researchers um, that were uh, uh, buying, uh, or sorry, building and developing zero day and doing all kinds of really interesting work in that respect. And they were selling to government agencies or law enforcement and things like that. But then uh, later other groups began to come out um, uh, that were companies that were building frameworks uh, that they would advertise as selling to you know, law enforcement and these special groups, but they really sell these frameworks to anybody. So they were coming into the industry and they were buying zero day exploits and they're saying, hey, we want these tools. Yes, we're good guys. Uh, but later you'd find out that they would sell to China, Iran, you know, all kinds of oppressive regimes. They, I mean, you'd find the tools in the hands of the FSB or the GRU. I mean, it, was, it, it really became interesting. And it became harder and harder and harder to tell who the good guys were versus who the bad guys were. Um, in about 2015, uh, we had an incident where we sold um, a zero day to uh, a local entity called SICOM USA um, that was referred to and vouched for uh, by us. Um, and we ended up selling to SICOM. Um, SICOM was a, a sort of a, an external branch or some kind of outreach from hacking team. Our tool ended up um, in hacking team's hands. Uh, hacking team uh, then suffered a breach. And when they suffered a breach, uh, everything was exposed. And when everything was exposed, we found out that they were selling to oppressive regimes. Now, the good news was our tool had just been sold uh, to them. And uh, because of the breach and because the tool was exposed, it was useless. So there was no chance of it being used or you know, anything. It was patched pretty quickly actually after that. Now, <clears throat> I saw somebody ask, what is a zero day? So uh, a zero day is a piece of software uh, that exploits or leverages a vulnerability in uh, a piece of technology. Uh, but the vulnerability is unknown to everyone else except for the author of the zero day and the, the, the researcher that discovered the vulnerability. Um, and the reason why they call it a zero day is because there are uh, zero days to defend um, against that uh, vulnerability. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a very valuable piece of technology in that you don't know what you're being attacked with um, and uh, you have no way of defending it against it. So if I have a zero day exploit for say an iPhone, right? I can maybe send you a text message and I can compromise your phone, take full control of your phone, read your text messages, read your emails, do GPS to track you, listen to your voice. And when you connect to a Wi-Fi network, I can use your phone as a bridge to get into your Wi-Fi network. Um, a good example of ethical use of a zero day can be seen in the press. Um, uh, the FBI, I don't remember how many years ago it was, uh, maybe 2014, 15, 13, around then, uh, they used a zero day exploit uh, for Firefox to bust a giant, uh, a really big uh, child porn rig or ring, uh, and they were able to bring a lot of people to justice. Uh, if they didn't have that zero day exploit, those kids would still be getting exploited. Um, uh, you know, so there's a lot of legitimate use. What's unfortunate is <clears throat> the zero day industry as a whole um, seems really shady because it's secretive and it's secretive by nature. You can't tell people about the tool because if you tell people about the tool, they're going to know how to detect it. And then the whole point of being able to attack covertly is eliminated. Um, you also don't talk about the buyers because if you talk about the buyers, you're giving away, you know, the people that might use it and what might actually happen. It's an operational impact. 
And so because it's secretive, right, just like Area 51, people think that it's this super shady market where you're selling the equivalent of nuclear weapons and you're spying on citizens and we're like the ninjas behind PRISM, you know, which is completely not true. And, and here's why it's not true. If a zero-day exploit is destroyed by exposure, in other words, the moment it becomes public knowledge, it's useless, right? A zero-day exploit for an iPhone, for example, today costs about $7 million, right? When you fire that zero-day exploit off once, if you fire it off at a savvy target, that target can reverse engineer the whole situation you know, forensically and figure out exactly what happened. That zero-day exploit is burnt. So you're not going to use a zero-day exploit for mass surveillance or mass compromise because you might get two or three days of use out of it. You're going to use something like that to bust a child porn ring or to do some kind of you know, espionage type operation. Um, it's not going to be the kind of thing uh, that's used for mass surveillance. And, and really, you know, if you think about people's mindsets, you know, they look at Area 51 and they think, oh my God, aliens, alien technology, spaceships, right? Area 51 is the base that's used to test planes and they're called X-planes, right? There's no aliens there. But because it's secretive, conspiracy theorists have all these ideas about what happens. No, I ran, I ran. I ran into the base. It was fine. It's like <laughs> yeah. it's like there's nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> I somehow that doesn't surprise me, <laughs> you know. But uh, but I mean, in that same context, the zero day exploit industry, um, and the market, I think, is the area fifty one uh, in a large way of hacking. But it is if you're going to be an offensive, um, an offensive attacker, uh, zero day exploits are the ultimate tool because they're not defensible. Um, and that's why they sell for so much money. Sure, thank you. My next question is for Phil. Phil, um, I'm going to ask you all these questions, but uh, later on we'll talk with Jason and Adriel also. What does your lab look like? So for somebody who's just starting out, um, do you need to know Linux? Um, uh, that is one of the questions. What does your uh, lab look like? And uh, then Jason, there are, there are a bunch of questions for you. Yeah, so uh, yeah, Noe Linux uh, helps. There's a distribution called Kali Linux that has all the tools that you that you need. Uh, um, so that's that's very useful to, to know that. Uh, that being said, you don't need to be an expert in, in Linux. Uh, I've done some tests for companies or break into companies with not even like a, a it's just a phone. So you don't necessarily need to uh, uh, be an expert in, in Linux. As to my lab, uh, well, <laughs> I can show you by Clean everything yesterday, but it's pretty messy. Uh, it's a lot of old computers, uh, but mainly because I'm a old school. I've been doing it for a long time. Now you can do everything from just one laptop uh, using uh, uh, some virtualization um, and running a bunch of, of different uh, 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 machines. Um, I just wanted to go back because the, the the topic before you were talking about how to to learn uh, um, to to some of these uh, skills. We talked about uh, bug bounty, but there's also other programs like uh, uh, the, the CTF or Capture the Flag in most of the conferences uh, that actually be really, really good. Uh, some of them are based on, on real scenarios of uh, vulnerabilities that we find in, in enterprise or, or um, in some of the pen tests that we do. Uh, and that's a really good uh, way to, to learn. You don't have to finish all the, the, the CTF or end up first, but even just reading uh, uh, the write-ups that people do uh, at the end of the CTF or, or they solve uh, these or that problems, uh, it's a really good source of, uh, of information. Sure. And uh, do they have to have, like back in the day uh, when I was um, like learning about network security and things, uh, I would uh, have like on-prem, right? Because there was no cloud at that time. So, yep. so now, uh, do does somebody starting off today need to have like you said different laptops and different devices on on prem or is there a possible like uh, um, in the cloud also like they could uh, probably use you can I mean you can do both I'm a old schooler so I like to have everything on premise uh, I don't I don't really trust the, the cloud especially when you're gonna uh, put some machine virtual machine that are vulnerable so you can learn uh, uh, things so if you don't secure it correctly. Other people can break into your lab before you do. Um, so I would, uh, uh, I, I, I like on-premise, but uh, you don't have to have like the, the latest or the craziest uh, uh, computer, some old laptops that you find on eBay or, or even your uh, uh, older computers. 
are plenty to 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 learn. You want to do like these crazy specs. <laughs> Phil, I know like so the way Phil's office is situated right now, the direction he's facing in, he has a Commodore 64 and a whole bunch of other <laughs> really old computers too. So <laughs> talks about <laughs> talks about the technology like that. Yeah, he's right. He's got the old stuff. <laughs> got all. And one of the questions I think uh, Adriel, you got asked, but I'm going to ask Phil now. What about the new technologies? What about the new containerized uh, machines, et cetera? Um, and, and the new environment, right? Like that we have, we are spinning up like virtual machines by the hour. And uh, is, it, is it difficult to hack those or uh, can you share your experience? I can start. Uh, uh, I, I think the virtual machine is not necessarily harder. Uh, the thing is, as opposed to, to previous, I mean, I've been doing that for a long time where we had physical server. Um, historically, we had like, I mean, in, I don't know, in a the company, they had like 50 servers to run everything. Now they have like 500 servers because everything has to be like specific servers. Uh, but that brings other challenges is like all the, the patch management and the configuration management. So instead of managing your 50 servers, now you have to manage 500. So you have more chance of messing something up. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, make it more secure, uh, despite what the, the, the uh, uh, virtualization vendors tell you. Um, it, it's good to make the management uh, uh, sometimes easier because you have a team just dedicated to manage this service or this service and they can only access this machine. Uh, but from a security perspective, it doesn't bring much. Sure, thanks. Um, coming back to um, all, all three of you, when we are talking about uh, um, hacking something or finding a vulnerability on something, um, what about like all the smart devices and do you have to like be a lifelong learner because as new technologies and everything comes up and how do you manage uh, that? Because we started off like really a long time hmm. back. Well, I think one of the, the key thing is uh, that's where the passion comes in. You have to constantly be learning. This is not a static field. This is not uh, where it's like, oh, this is how we've always done it. No, it's always gonna be something new. Uh, and when you talk about, uh, and one of the things that the ever evolving threatscape, the ever evolving landscape that you're going to have to keep learning, especially IOT devices, you know, it's like, there was literally one of my favorite stories about IOTs is a college whose network went down. And the reason why was a distributed denial of service on their network, their internal, internal network by their vending machines and light bulbs. The light bulbs and the vending machines were going out to the internet to go to a sushi restaurant page for some reason. And it's like, and all that traffic brought the network down. It's like, and when your threat model has to include your vending machine and light bulbs, then your threat landscape is a little bit larger than you probably anticipated, okay? It's like, and it shouldn't be necessary. So yeah, you have to learn. It's like all these devices are connecting now. So many things that are connecting. You don't know what that point of entry is in. I mean, I loved printers. It's like printers were some of the easiest ways to get in because they had built-in FTP servers. You could run the exploits from them. You could actually use them as your, your, your launch base. It's like in your storage area. It's like, so printers were great. And people were like, well, we got to be careful with printers. Well, now it's your light bulbs. It's your uh, phones. It's your other devices. It's your, uh, I mean, all these automated devices. Those are the key things. Those are what you have to watch out for now. So that's one of the key things we have to look at. It's like, you, you can't just say, I know enough. It's like, oh, I've got this covered. It's like, because even in the field you're in, even if no matter how specialized it is, there's new developments happening all the time. It's like, this is never going to be a resting on my laurels kind of thing. It's like, no one talks about, you know, it's like, it's never about, you know, it's like, well, what have you robbed lately? You know, it's like, what, what, have, you, what have you broken into last? It's like, you know, what, what was the thing that you, you pwned next? It's like, so, so yeah, so you can't, and that's, if you don't see that as not a challenge, but as something to be excited about, 
the fact that you're always going to have to learn something, that you're always learning something new, that there's always a different challenge or like, crap, this totally changes the game. They just totally rewrote the API. It's like I have, I mean, all that work on that vulnerability is gone now. It's like I have to figure out some another way in. This is not the right field for you, okay? Because that's what this is about. It's about going like, oh, crap, this was just a 40 hours I just face planted because they just they just did a uh, they rolled out an update it's like how many people have been in, in an engagement before and all of a sudden the, the the desktop support team decided to roll out patches and then all of a sudden your way of entry was like oh well there that goes you know it's like it happens so it's like so that means it's just another opportunity to find another way in uh, there's a question which says that uh, there are are there more job openings in red team, purple team, or blue teams, and uh, anyone better than the other? I will say straight out. It's like I mean I, I didn't mean to cut off Adriel, but it's like because he's got because especially him being a retailer, he's like I will say it's like I think that people should stop trying to be instant red teamers. I think people should stop saying oh I just want to be the breaker because I'm like. No, I spent my first 10 years of my career as a blue teamer. It's like building the defenses, learning what the processes were, weren't learning what the risk on, on investment, it's like the risk of the, uh, the risk returns were, learning what the businesses did and what they were really trying to protect. And then I spent the last 10 years, it's like, you know, breaking into them. It's like trying to strengthen them. It's like, so I say that you should start learning the discipline of how things are built, learning the networking, learning how the things are connected and how businesses operate because that provides better value to them once you start showing them the vulnerabilities. It's like breaking is so easy. Everybody wants easy mode. Everybody wants the the, the one button, you know, it's like, boop. it's like, you know, and thanks to Metasploit and other tools, we've got that now, but still, it's like, you've got to, besides just push the button, you have to understand why it works. You have to understand why it impacts the network. You have to understand how it impacts the business. It's like, because if you don't know how your company makes money, then you're not going to understand how the vulnerability is going to impact them on how they make money. Because they're not all created equal. So it's like, so you have to learn that process first. Learning how to break things are going to be great and it's going to be fun and it's valuable, but learn how to defend it first. Sure. Yeah, I agree with uh, Jason. I did exactly the, the same thing for the past, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, um, five to 10 years of my career. I was just being a, a, a blue teamer. So when I was working at a pharmaceutical company, I was managing all firewalls and network security. Uh, and that's how you learn all the shortcuts and all the things are working. Then you can go on the other side and say like, this is most likely the shortcuts that people are, are taking, and so you can break into into things. Yeah, I, I think I'd have to agree with you guys. Um, I think I think the best way to start uh, in this is maybe starting off as a blue teamer, uh, because you get an understanding of what's coming at you at that specific point in time. Um, but I would also suggest that um, it's very difficult to become a good red teamer. Anybody can become a script kid and use tools like Nessus and Metasploit and, you know, pop a shell and feel like they're really good at what they do. Um, but using third party tools does not really make you great at what you do. It does not make you um, uh, really good at being an offensive player. Mm -hmm. um, to be an offensive player, you have to have that innate curiosity that we talked about before. You have to have the ability to solve a really complex problem uh, with a really simple solution. Um, you have to understand how the defensive technologies work so that you can be evasive. You have to understand uh, how people think across different demographics so you can socially engineer them. You have to know where to find uh, really good open source intelligence, including but not limited to breach data. Um, I mean, historical breaches and all the data that's ever been stolen is available on the internet and the dark web. Um, so the passwords that we all use you know, uh, as of probably three to six months ago are, are things that, uh, you know, we can look up and find. And, you know, there are all kinds of things you have to do. Um, I can tell you, you know, here at NetroGuard, uh, we bring people in that come highly recommended. And uh, it's very rare, even uh, in that context, that we find people that we're really happy with. 
Um, we, we might get people that come in that are uh, recommended and they were superstars at you know, um, a different firm uh, for doing testing. And then they, they come to work with us and they say, well, you know, do you have Metasploit Pro? Uh, do you have Nextpose? And we're like, no, that's not how we work. You know, do it this way. And they say, okay, they go and they deliver the, the, the project. And then, uh, you know, Phil comes to me and he's like, what is this? And I, I look at him thinking, what is this? This isn't, you know, and, and, and Phil will jump on it or one of our other senior guys will jump on it and they just tear it to pieces. Uh, so, so that's, that's the norm. Um, it's, it's very difficult. It's easy to get a job with most penetration testing vendors uh, because most penetration testing vendors don't play at the same level as the bad guys. It's really difficult to get a, a, a good position um, at a vendor uh, that does play at realistic levels of threat uh, because that skill set is unique and it's really hard to build and it's really hard to find. You can get there, just follow your passion, follow your hunger, do what you love. If you love it, you'll become the best. Right? And it doesn't have to be one or, or the other. You can still have a day job as a blue teamer and then do some red team uh, uh, as a freelance uh, uh, worker on the side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, actually. And I tell people, it's like, one of the things that you have to understand, it's like, when I go in, it's like, and this is one of the things I love about uh, Adrian said that he he allows this. It's like, it's like, because when I go into a location, it's like I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to vulnerability you. It's like I'm not trying to like, you know, uh, uh, do an assessment. It's like I'm there to mess you up. I'm there to rob you. It's like I'm a bad guy. It's like I'm not trying to like figure out what something. I'm like I could steal that. That's mine now, you know? It's like, I look for the vulnerability. I tell people, I don't know, you know, we, we, there's all these coding debates, Python, Ruby. I don't know how to code. I couldn't code out of, I tried coding with Minecraft with my daughter. She did better at it than I am. She's 12, you know, when she was 12. She did better at it than I did. I just can't do programming. But I don't know how to do a SQL injection very well, but mother, I can go into your server room and steal your SQL server I still got the database, you know? So it's like, you go with what your strengths are. And so, but you go in as the mindset of, I'm trying to attack you. I'm not trying to find findings. It's like to put in an audit. You're not being audited, you're being robbed. It's like, you need to make sure that you've got that in your threat model. You need to make sure you're actually looking what your risk assessment is. It's like people go and they try to do all these high scale attacks like it's like well we don't have to worry about nation states and i'm like dude i walked in and within two minutes i got your your everything it's like that's a threat model it's like because i didn't know anybody in there so you need to make sure that you're showing them real world attack methods and what a, a real world attacker a real world criminal is going to try to steal they're not trying to go and find a cve finding on your web page for tls they're trying to find a way to get into your network so they can compromise you and steal from you. It's like, and that's one of the things you have to focus on. And uh, one of the things that um, I want like people to know is that you need to niche down rather than be a generalist. What do you, what do you think about that? Means you suppose you want to be a greatest exfiltration of data expert, right? Then hmm. that's your thing. Instead of like trying to be good at everything, so, so what, what, do you agree with that? Do you have like input on that? What do you say? I think you should be, generally, I think you should be, <laughs> it's like a generalist up to a point. You need to know all the different fields so you can find out which one you want to specialize in. It's like the first 10 years of my uh, career in information security, it's like I was a generalist. I did firewalls, I did IDSs, it's like I did policy, it's like I did all these different things, it's like incident response, it's like I learned all those different factors. And then I found my niche. It turns out I'm really good at robbing people in person. It's like, you know, and doing social engineering and physical compromise. And so I found my specialty. You don't have to automatically say, this is what my specialty has to be. It's like, look around, look at all the different fields, Find what you're good at. Find out what you like doing. Find out what you enjoy. And then you figure out how to get uh, paid for it. Then you find the specialty. Then you find out what you focus on that. Yeah. But don't automatically think, 
bug bounties. That's what my specialty is. I'm going to be a bug bounty person, or I'm going to be a forensic person. It's like, really? How good are you with numbers? Well, I suck at numbers. Well, you're going to suck as a forensic person, okay? It's like, so you, you need to learn what your specialty is and your niche. You can't just go and say, this has the most benefit. This makes the most money. This is the best career thing. It's like, I'm going to specialize in that. For some, it's going to work. For some, I mean, they're going to be miserable sometimes, but it's, it's going to work for them. It's like, but generally, it's not. So you can start off with the journalist. You don't have to say, I have to know every, I have to know just one thing. Learn the different fields. Learn to understand. That's one of the key things I liked about the CISSP when I started out. I mean, legit liked about it because it gave you a two inch depth, but a mile wide field of like letting you know all these other fields existed. So you could dip your toe in it and see what it was about and see which one piqued your interest, which one made it more interesting for you. So you could then specialize on it. So it's like, have your foundation as a generalist before you become that specialist that you want. Sure, thanks. And um, I think we are on the top of the hour, but um, uh, Jason, tell us about your uh, bank job in Beirut. It's like... <clears throat> well, I, I I will say that there's several podcasts. It's like on it. It's like um, Dark Knight, Dark Knight Diaries, episode six, uh, talks about it very well. It's like, and there I did one for the social engineering podcast, uh, which I went into some good detail. Uh, it just I I had to go to the bathroom really bad, and when you have to go, uh, I mean, Diet Pepsi has caused me a lot of problems in the past. It's like this was a full bottle when we started. Uh, and I, and so I just, I went in, and, I, and who knew that Lebanon had freaking banks on every freaking corner, like a Starbucks. It's like, so, but unlike Starbucks, they're owned by different companies. So when you're doing a break-in, it's like when you're doing a pen test, make sure you're in scope. That's always important. Make sure the IP addresses are in scope. Make sure you're actually going into the company's subnet, not someone else's. Uh, it's more difficult and awkward when it's actually a physical building and you're robbing the bank next door to the bank you were supposed to be robbing. Let's just say it took me about four hours uh, not to end up in prison. Uh, and uh, Philippe was there. It's like, uh, it, was, it was not a pleasant experience. It's like, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, yeah, I did not, literally, I did not sleep. I was not really in a good feeling place. Uh, until I was on the plane to Paris and I was leaving the country. It's like, okay, <laughs> it's like, they're not going to haul me off the plane. It's like, so yeah. So Philip, uh, can you describe what happened? Uh, I think there's, there was there was some videos out there. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it, try it try was, not to was, incriminate yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, now Philippe's like, I don't know about that. I was not part of that. It's like, <laughs> It's like, dude, I, I'm I'm an immigrant here. It's like I don't want to risk anything. It's like it's like, it's like I don't want to get kicked out. Like, it's like, dude, it's fine. It's like yeah. because I did. I traded the company. It's like I ended up. It's like once I found out that I was in the wrong bank, uh, which was very unfortunate. It's like uh, I then talked to the company and I explained to them all the things they did wrong that allowed me to rob them. You know, and because I literally had gotten compromised. I literally had plugged in devices into their networks. It's like I, when I left, it turns out, I find out the next day that when I left that branch uh, to go to the head office, because I, I didn't just, they didn't just let me out. It's like, it's like I had to go to the head office and talk to the people there. Uh, but once I left that branch, they closed that branch down. And they did a forensic wipe on every single machine in that branch. And I was like legit impressed. I was like, that's a good response. I'm a scary mother. You know, it's like, I wouldn't have, been, I wouldn't have taken my word for it either. It's like, that was a good response. It's like, and so, and so I showed them all the things they did, they did wrong that allowed me to rob them. And we, we traded. It's like, that was consulting. That was free consulting. They, they got a free pen test out of it. It's like, I didn't get jail time out of it. It's like, everybody was happy. 
sort of. It's like uh, by the time it was over. <laughs> so I, I guess the motto of the story here at Nature Guard is that we hire bank robbers. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh my, my daughter in the third grade. It's like going to the school to talk to the teacher because your daughter is so proud to tell people my dad robs banks for a living. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, do you have any last uh, comments? Uh, because there has been like a lot of uh, interest in uh, what you do and how you do it, etc. But one thing, one question which com keeps on coming up is, what does your setup look like? Uh, hardware setup. So is there something that you can just uh, quickly? Um, the, the, the answer to that is, it, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, you don't, you don't need fancy hardware to do something incredible. Um, you know, you don't need, you know, the pineapple, for example, to do Wi-Fi hacking. You can use, you know, a really old laptop. Um, you don't, you don't need a really fast computer to, uh, to breach something. Uh, the real hardware is up in your head. Uh, it has nothing to do with, you know, lights on your computer or how many processors you have or any of that stuff. Um, uh, the only time you need, you know, powerful hardware uh, I think is if you're going to be doing, you know, really heavy crypto type work, um, then you can use GPUs, um, you know, to, to make that more efficient. Um, maybe you would want something like an amplifier, um, you know, for, for, you know, more advanced Wi-Fi, you know, and long range Wi-Fi hacking type stuff. Um, there are devices that, um, that Jason has actually, he has um, one of these that he uses at our clients all the time, a USB Ninja. It actually has a microprocessor in it and you can use it to dump payloads into computers. So you just drop the charger or you steal somebody else's charger, put that in. When they go to charge their phone, you infect their computer with their USB cable. Um, you know, so there, there are little things like that, but do you need that kind of stuff? Only if the operation or the engagement <laughs> calls for it, right? Yeah. Um, if you're doing physical work, yes. But I mean, if you're working from home, just, you know, take an old laptop and you're going to get in. Yeah, I would like to say, first of all, thanks, Philippe, for setting up the USB Ninja for me. It's like, uh, <laughs> he's, he's the brains behind my brawn. It's like, you know, I just I just go into brute force and build break into places. It's like, he gives me all the cool payloads and toys to like make sure that I, I come back with creds. But um, I want to tell people, it's like, and one of the key things that we have to understand, it's like in this, in this field, is that especially uh, us three, we're incredibly blessed. It's like and fortunate uh, to have what we have. It's like people look at my lab and they see all the computers and they see all the things and you can see it on Twitter. And it's like, and I've got like all these different pictures. I even did a YouTube video of a crib style walkthrough of my lab. It's like, and I am telling you, no matter where you are in the world, it's like, because this is a global society, you can get a Raspberry Pi and put a Kali Linux distro, there's a Kali Linux distro that goes on the Raspberry Pi. It's like, and that's your computer. It's like, and that's something that you can learn to hack on. It's like, you can go and find these tutorials. You can go to a library. It's like, and have a USB uh, uh, bootable drive and boot up that computer. It's like, or have a, a DVD of it. It's like, and boot up that computer in Kali and learn it. It's like once you've asked permission from the librarians to, to be able to do that, permission's always important. But always understand that it's like you can't let you stop you from learning because your biggest threat, your biggest thing is all the people that are going to tell you realistically why you can't accomplish it. It's like, I don't have the money for a, a, a fancy laptop. I don't have money uh, for all this equipment. It's like, I can't build a lab like that. It's like, that shouldn't stop you. It's like, I did not start with all this stuff. It's like, it grew. And it was a lot of fighting and it was a lot of like proving people wrong. One of the best things about having haters is they motivate you because you look at all the people you get to piss off with your success. You know, it's like, it's, it's sort of fun. So you, you have to understand that. It's like, don't let that stop you. It's like, don't look at the things that you have to, to work on. It's like, or what other people have. It's like, understand what you're going to accomplish with what you've got. It's like, and that's what you focus on. So a, a freaking Raspberry Pi Zero for $15. 
It's like, make that work. Get an old CRT. Go to uh, go dumpster dive in old computer firms and stuff and try to find a, a, a monitor. It's like, go around in like certain businesses and say that you'll remove their old equipment for them and stuff, you know, and take some of that equipment. My old, I remember one of the old servers that I used to have was an old compact server that was being discontinued. It's like, I mean, that thing was a beast. It's like, uh, it's like, but it worked. And that was something for me to hack on. That was something for me to learn with. It's like, so find those things, find the old stuff, find the stuff that people don't want and make it yours. It's like, and make it work. It's like, and then progress from it. But finance is not a barrier. It's like, where you're at is not a barrier. It's like the barrier is what you let people think and put on you, including yourself. I have never let reality get in the way of me trying to accomplish something. Realistically, I shouldn't be here right now. It's like, but who cares about reality? It's like, it's outdated and it's, it's stupid and it's normal. And who wants to be normal? It's like, go for it. It's like, learn the things that you want to learn and find and hack your solution no matter what equipment you're on. It's like, if you got a phone, there's phone CTFs, you, there's web browser uh, based CTFs that you can learn from. It's like, there is nothing stopping you from learning. It's like, there's nothing stopping you from learning. Downloading books, printing them out. It's like finding them. It's like an old bookstore. It's like reading it, no matter how outdated, it gives you the methodology. It teaches you how to, to progress and, and gives you better ways to think on, on the solutions and the problems. It's like Raspberry Pis, it's like Beagle Bones, old laptops, a Chromebook. It's like a netbook. It's like, those are ways that get you to learn. Sure, sure, thanks. Because uh, most people think that maybe hackers have the best equipment and because we all watch movies, right? So like when, whenever they say, oh, I've got this, it's got like three TV and this and that. Nobody says, oh, I've got this Ram Shekel like uh, Raspberry Pi and I'm trying to uh, patch yeah. that together and make some kind of a Frankenstein uh, lab to, you know, um, do penetration testing or yeah. stuff. Look, look at Kobe, uh, look at LeBron James, look at Michael Jordan. It's like, yeah, they've got their own indoor basketball course and everybody's got that. It's like everybody started somewhere. It's like, don't judge where you're at by someone else's success who's already made it. It's like, look at freaking Adriel's effing freaking office right there. I mean, look how amazing that is. I got, I'm jelly. I'm jealous of it. It's like, but I'm not like competitive jealous. I'm not like jealous like, well, I can't believe he deserves it. I'm jealous like, I respect that. He worked hard for that. It's like, you don't see the tears. You don't see the blood and the sweat that he put in to make that happen. You're just seeing the result of it. It's like, so don't look at the success that we have or look at my lab or Philippe's lab or Adriel's lab and goes like, well, gosh, it's like they, they go, no, that's not where it started. I had an old compact laptop. That's where it started. It's like, and we're not going to tell about where it got. Statue of Limitations is over. Someone, you know, someone found it and gave it to me. It's like, you know, really cheap. It's like, and that's how I started. And that's how I learned. It's like, and then old reused computers. It's like old CRT monitors that were thrown away. That's how I started. All my yeah. equipment when I first started my lab was hand-me-downs and uh, garbage. It's like, and it was someone else's garbage that I turned into usefulness for me. It's like, so don't compare what we've got now as a success. It's like, that's not, that's our success. It's like, it, it's not your success. Your success is going to be just as great or greater than us. I know so many other people that do so much. Adriel's lab is 10 times better than mine. His house, I've been to his house. Oh my gosh. It's like, it's what my house wants to be when it grows up. You know, it's like Philippe's house. I'm not even going to go into because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost maliciously jealous of his pile, the place. Okay, his I'm jealous place. too. <laughs> like, I, so, almost, I I wanted to buy his house out from under him actually before he moved in. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, but that that's great because I can see their successes and those spur me on to keep going. It's like so. Yeah, so don't look at, well, you don't have the right equipment or, you know, that's too much machine for you or you need to have this fancy distro. F that noise. It's like, 
work it and learn it and do it. It's like, don't, don't have the, the, the equipment be the excuse you're not succeeding or, or, or the environment is the reason why you're not succeeding or that you don't have the, the, enough RAM is why you're not succeeding. Mother, no, that's not an excuse. It's like, you can make it work. Yeah, one of the things that you said, Jason, that um, I think we've beneficial for everybody to really take away from this is uh, the point on limitations. And whenever you talk about that, it really resonates because when I was probably, I don't know, five years old, six years old, my grandfather told me that he was going to give me uh, probably the best advice of his life. And he said to me, he said, don't let anybody limit you. He said, you're the only person that can limit what you're going to do. If you decide that you want to do something, or if you decide you want something, find a way to get it. And right there, that's the essence of becoming a good hacker, a good researcher. You, you see something, it intrigues you, you want to figure it out. And, and going back to you know, Jason's point about the, the, the hackers that he talked about from you know, way back in history, that's what they did. They had ideas, they had visions, they wanted to see something, they made it happen. There's no limit to what you can make happen. Right. And for us, uh, it's the exact same thing. When you look at an infrastructure or you look at the fences or you look at how a person's mind works, you know, if you want to do something to them or to the infrastructure, you want to, uh, you know, create an outcome, you're going to find a way. And uh, where other people are going to say, oh, I give up. It's too hard. I put too much effort into this. We're not going to give up. We're tenacious. We're persistent. We're stubborn. Um, and and I, I really think that that's one of the biggest secrets to this whole game. Thank you so much for joining us today on Cybersecurity Career Talks. I will just end the live stream now and we can talk.